you very much for staying with us. Now, Epitaphs and Dreams, Poems to Remember the Struggle by Professor Patrick Fitzgerald evokes emotion as it takes the reader through the struggle for liberation. Many of the poems were written when uh, Prof Fitzgerald was in exile. He joins me now in studio to talk about the poems, the power of memory and why we need to remember the struggle. Prof, thank you very much for joining me this morning. Thank you very much. Good morning in interesting times. Yeah, <laughs> let, let, let's talk about, about these poems because I... I I've gone through them and a lot of what you wrote in the 1980s while in exile somehow is, is mirrored in what we're seeing today. Well, I'm so pleased that you say that mm. because I might have to justify why I'm publishing a poetry collection mm. where most of the poetry was actually written from the struggle era and mainly between the late 70s and, mm. and the very early 90s. Why would I publish this poetry? Mm. at this time. And Why did you feel the need to Well, publish? you know, I, I think I, I, I felt that suddenly poems that I felt were no longer relevant again seemed relevant, and I felt a need maybe to remind myself and other people mm. about the values or the supposed values we, f we thought that we were actually struggling for. Mm. Um, in, in, a, in, a, in a South Africa where maybe some of that value fabric seems to be collapsing. Mm. And I just felt the need to remind myself, I'd forgotten what color SUV I was fighting for when I was in mm. the underground and when I was in exile or what tender I thought I was going to get. You know, I couldn't remember mm. these things. Mm. And I thought, well, let me, let me go back. Let me collect these poems from all the different places they were published and actually find out what it was all about. Prof, and you know, that's interesting because we had a discussion before and you mentioned to me that you were on a sabbatical at the time when you discovered a lot of this poetry. Take me back to that, motion, that moment when you started reading through w who you were in the 1980s well, you know, and as opposed to who you are now. You know, I never wanted to be a Wenui. You, you know, in, when I was uh, at, at WITS as an undergraduate in the 70s, there were all these white Rhodesians used to speak about when we were in Rhodesia. Mm. So we called them the Wenwees. Mm. Then in the early 90s, there were a lot of people who came back, you know, um, from exile who had been in the struggle. And they said, when we were in the struggle, when we were in the political underground, and so on. And we said, no, these are Wenwees. We want to create the new South Africa. Mm. I didn't want to go back. I wanted to go forward and take the opportunity to build the country that we'd been fighting for. But when I had this opportunity to look around at what was happening in mm. the country and to try and collect these poems, to try and restore some kind of sense of values, you know, there's two ways, well, people, to, young people especially see the struggle now. They either see it as, um, you know, this, these, these immortal heroes yeah. who could do nothing wrong, who liberated us. Oh, finding fault in those and, forefathers. And that's sort of dissolving now. Yeah. And the other thing is that, oh, the people in the struggle are just a bunch of rascals and scoundrels mm. and opportunists. Mm. And both of those things are wrong. Yeah. The, the I've even heard words uh, in relation to the struggle being, they've sold us out. Yes, well, you know, I can understand why people say that. But maybe it's slightly more complex. Yeah. But I didn't want to look back. But now I thought we need to look back in mm. order to reboot ourselves to go forward because the country seems to have lost its way mm. in terms of values, in terms of what we were trying to achieve. And it's not that I want to go back and be nostalgic about the struggle. Not, it's not that at all. I wanted to remind mm. ourselves yeah. and anybody who would read or would be prepared to read what... I've offered. Let, let's quickly talk about w one of the things that I found very striking is you talk about uh, June 1976. Yes. And you talk about how images of who we are has become faded. Yes. We are caught in, um, we've almost replaced our real history with a history that's been, uh, that's been yes. fed to us. It's, it's reflected back yeah. from the media. I know I'm in the media now and I have great respect for the media. Yeah. But the media is not reality. Yeah. And um, the media, although it has a key and essential role in society, 
needs to be supplemented by other things, but were these like writing, like literature. But Prof, was, the, it was, was this the issues that you were facing back then, even in the 80s? Because when I read it, it it's, it's so striking to me that a lot of what you're talking about that you wrote in the 80s is so reflective now, even in Urban Guerrilla, mm. where you write, I, I think, wow, this is, I, I'm, I'm experiencing this now. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe poetry always has an edge of prophecy if it works, or or maybe, maybe the poetry is just too late. Yeah. Or, or maybe it was in time, but nobody listened to it. Yeah. But I think that's the fate of poetry. Does poetry ever make anything happen? Yeah. or does because it? Because that's what you question in yeah. the intro of your book as well. Does it make something happen? Or maybe not directly, but indirectly. Mm. Does it make people think again? Stop and reflect. But, okay. Challenge themselves, challenge others. There was an interesting, the, also part of our, our pre-interview, uh, you talked about poems to remember the struggle yes. was an uncomfortable fit and it's something you wanted uh, to fight for. Why did you think it was so important to have it on the jacket of this book, poems to remember the struggle? Well, my publishers had a reservation because they said, look, once people think it's struggle poems, they won't buy it because struggle poems are reputation for being cliches, um, not being very good poems, or even if they're good poems to declaim at a political meeting, they don't work as, you know, cold print on cold paper. Yeah. And I said, no, this is really essential. It's the, I believe that these struggle poems, and I say struggle poems, they're poems written in the struggle. People continued their lives in the struggle. Mm. They continue to have lives. They continue to have relationships. They continue to be passionate. They continue to have doubt. You know, I was in the struggle. I was there, or well, at least for some part of it, yeah. the latter part. I know the struggle was a very long thing. Mm. It, it, it took hundreds of years. But I was very much there in, in the heart of it in that last period. Yeah. And I think some of that humanity, some of the real passions, the real emotions, we weren't angels, we weren't immortal, we were real people. But we were struggling for something that we believed in. Hmm. And um, I wanted to go back and remember that part of the struggle, that human part. Prof, do me a favor. I, I know you've marked off a poem that you quickly want to read for us. Can, we, can you read it for us very quickly? I can. Thank you very much. Um, it was a tough choice. But I'm, I'm going to read a poem that remembers yeah. the artist, the fine artist, Tami Mignelli. Okay. who I worked with in Medu Art Ensemble in Khabaroni for many years. He was murdered by SADF commanders on 14th of June 1985 in Khabaroni. Yeah. And he, he was a great artist. Cut You've got short. about 20 seconds, Prof. Okay, it's called No Taxi Home. From one country, us, we met in a second. I'm writing this in a fourth. The taxis here slither through the drizzle and derelict streets. I'm not looking for one now, because there's still no taxi home. So where can I start? How to explain? News of your death came by radio. Numbers were being broadcast, but no names. Then the telex machine clattered and chattered, and the names came through neatly, letter by letter, like any other message. But it's very difficult, this. I don't know how to write about the way you drew. Design how you designed. An art to describe art. I don't even want to try. Yet your images cataract the sky, blinding the heart and binding the eye through mayhem, exile, rage, and fire. Come Moscow Youth Festival, the badge proudly on our lapels, elemental graphic in all your power, black hand, green stem, red, red blossom, silhouetted of a freedom weapon. 85 for our youth in the year of the Kada, and your death already due on the lukewarm earth. So how to explain, accustomed to your precision, in charcoal of labor or stylus of vision, in murals to foreshadow the simulacrum of our yearning, sketching of the earth to be taken, silk screens etching out a world still to be given. And your images cataract the sky, binding the heart and blinding the eye over mayhem, exile, okay. peace and fire. Wow.
That's powerful words, Prof. We can unfortunately run out of time. But I'm going to encourage everybody to go and get it. It's called Epitaphs and Dreams. It's written by Prof. Patrick Fitzgerald. It's available at all good bookstores. It's on your screen right now. Poems to Remember the Struggle. And I guarantee you it is going to spark a conversation. Anti-apartheid activist and academic Patrick Fitzgerald speaking to us about his new collection of poetry. Go and get it. We take an hour break. Take it anyway.